Welcome, everybody. Uh, my name is Reinhard Busse. I'm one of the co-directors of the European Observatory on Health Systems and Policies, and I'm also the permanent summer school director. Usually, we, call, we convene middle to senior level policymakers, people from institutions who, who shape the health system from all over Europe and partly beyond, and to discuss in Venice in a relaxed atmosphere topics of concern to all countries where they can all learn from each other. Last year, uh, we started this summer school series already back in 2007, and since then we have tackled many different topics from hospitals, from innovations, from pharmaceuticals, from public health, so for primary care, every year a different topic. Last year then, when what we thought would be a, a unique uh, thing, then we had to cancel the uh, in-person event in, in Venice and focused on the situation of the COVID crisis with a particular view on hospitals. Because originally last year, we thought we'd talk about the new role of hospitals in the future. And then it was very topic that we did decided to talk about hospitals in the in the pandemic then again we were planning and the next big topic on our list is actually twofold we have two two topics in in mind the one is that we take a close look in digitalization digitalization uh, with with all its facets and the even bigger topic of innovation since this this year again we only have an online event and i shouldn't say only i mean we have an exciting program prepared for you but we decided to really focus on one element of innovation and this is digital health and that we take the opportunity of the covid pandemic which taught us so much about the, the opportunities, the challenges, but also the challenges of digitalization and designed the summer school digital health towards a pan pandemic uh, future uh, to which you all signed up. The idea is that clearly we only have five days. We have very focused sessions of two hours, two hours each. And we still want to take a broad look at digital health and that, that we basically take the opportunity to, 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 to look at the question, where have we been? Where is the situation in a, in a variety of European countries when it comes to digital health? What are the opportunities for digital health when it comes to research? when it comes to, to, to healthcare and how can countries basically design a digital health strategy to make best use of, 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 the, of this tool of, 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 di of digitalization. That is in, in short what we have, what we have uh, set up. So today we, 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 we want to introduce a topic Every day is designed, except for Friday, that we have a short introductory keynote leading us to, to, to the topic. So where what is digital health? What are we talking about? And then we look at three country examples. Tomorrow, we look at how we de derive information from the information technology from digital health. Then we look at how digital health is changing health care on Wednesday. On Thursday, we look at digital health's uh, role for, for research, digital health fueling research. And on Friday, we have two sessions. One looks at our hosts here, the Veneto region. And I'm very happy to pass over to, for, to a welcome to them in a, in a second. And then we have a high-ranking policymakers uh, deep debate uh, how countries can forward the topic. 
Before I, I say any more to the details of today's topic, I'm very happy to uh, pass over to the representatives of our host, the Veneto region, a dear member and friend of the European Ob Ob Observatory, Assessora Lanzari. Please take the floor. Thank you and good afternoon. Welcome to this edition of the Venice Summer School that the European Observatory has been organized in collaboration with the Veneto region since 2007. The initiative is a part of a shared by that between the European Observatory of Alt System Policies and our region. Uh, which has been increasingly strengthened over the years. Some key issues for the substantial and for the future of the health system in Italy and in Europe has been already addressed. Healthy human resource, innovation and technology, aging people, parapharmaceutical, primary care, patient quality of care, skill mix innovation and the hospital of the future during the COVID period that has been addressed the last year. Veneto region is extremely proud of the increasing fruitful relationship that has been developed over the years with the European Observatory, as we believe that the ability to act and work as part of an European international team is increasingly important. Therefore, we will be able to continuously provide appropriate responses to the healthcare demand of the citizens through the fair, efficient, and sustainable and high profile service programmation. The theme of this year is digital health towards a post pandemic future. In particular, the summer school will explore the state of digital health tools in Europe before and during the pandemic with a look towards future China. I'm sure that this week will be an enrichment for all of you, but for the Veneto region as well. It has been always attentive to the promotion of the dialogue between, uh, between the teacher and the local health dimension and the international and multicentric vision of the European Union, the World Health Organization and other international agency part of the, this sector. Prevention, Tracting and treatment was a trinomial that allowed to the digital health sector to gain its place within the healthcare context during the pandemic period. This aspect contributed also to the affirmation of its role in the healthcare process. The growth of digital health initiative continued in the Manitoba region during this year as well even if many initiatives were not necessarily linked to the pandemic emergency. They have contributed to receive a strong impulse. For example, there is a strong conviction that telemedicine should be permanently introducing the processes of healthcare, maintenance and research, as it would bring various benefits. In fact, the telemedicine strengthening with a law to decentralization health intervention more and more in order to reach and treat people in the community. This would support not only the treatment, but also the promotion of health matters. In order to reach these objectives, it's extremely important to employ all the embedded technologies that support the person, proximity, and it is also important to know how to organize the service with particular attention to the specific train of health professionals. The work emerged during these days will be contributed to consolidate the useful and important elements that will help us for the process of a complete transformation of the healthcare system in Veneto. The process has started already and we have been working in order to obtain the right balance between innovation, sustainability, quality, equity and universality. Our approach has been driven by the continuous research of excellence, an approach that is open to the European and international confrontation. Lastly, I would like to express my very sincere thanks to the Observatory, organized especially for the gracious and the continuous support of Dr. Joseph Figures and Professor Baus. Together, we are already working for the Summer School 2022. 
edition that will be held in presence as it's posthumous in Venice Island of San Sergio. Thank, thank you for these words of welcome from, from Veneto. And uh, with no further ado, uh, we want to start the first uh, session. Maybe a few notes of housekeeping. Uh, you are invited to use Twitter using the hashtag Ops Summer School 2021 uh, hash hashtag. And uh, when you have questions, during the during any of the four presentations which we will be hearing today then please um, uh, ask questions in in the chat box questions for clarification we have um, Dimitra Pantelli, who is uh, following the, the chat box and will filter, will give back all the, all the questions uh, to us and we will be answering them uh, after the respective presentations and maybe we keep uh, some of them also for the uh, closing panel discussion. With that, I'm very glad to introduce to you Nick Fahi. Nick Fahi is senior researcher in the um, Department of Primary Healthcare Sciences at the University of, of Oxford. And maybe for us here, besides his academic background, the most important thing you need to know about him that he used to be head of unit for health information in the uh, DG uh, Sanko for Health of the European Commission which clearly also gives him the the other side of the of of the viewpoint not only the the academics viewpoint and he's a personal friend and I'm especially happy Nick uh, that you do this first introductory keynote lecture um, which we will be all looking uh, forward you give an overview of the evolving challenge of digital health and I'm sure it's in 15 minutes, you can say everything about digital health. Over to you. Reinhard, thank you very much. Thank you for that very kind introduction. It's a pleasure for me too to, to be here and to be working with you to organize this uh, observatory summer school for 2021. Um, and so uh, my thanks also to all the other colleagues, to Dimi and to Annalisa and to um, Florian and the other colleagues who are involved in organizing the summer school. I will do my best, as you said, to uh, give you a short 15 minute overview uh, or that will help to set the scene for the wider and very interesting discussions that we're going to have during the week. Um, it's a pleasure in the participants, the attendees for this to see a mixture of uh, both some familiar faces and uh, lots of, of new people. And I'm sure that the, that combination will be a rich one. And we look forward to you putting lots of thoughts and questions into the chat, Reinhardt, as you outlined. So I am going to uh, talk about the challenge of digital health. And uh, I just want to say that in this few words, which I'm going to say, I'm drawing principally on material from a forthcoming policy brief from the European Observatory, which I've been working on together in particular with uh, my colleague Gemma Williams, also from the Observatory and um, the London School of Economics, and as well as a wide range of co-authors and colleagues from across the HSPM network of the Observatory, and uh, so credit to them as well for the insights and the, uh, the material which I'm going to be drawing on in this short introduction. Let me start by uh, a couple of definitions, because when we talk about digital health, I'm always conscious of the fact that we've used lots of different terms in this field down the years. Um, Reinhard, you very kindly didn't say how long we've been working together, but it's been a, 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 a perhaps a rather long time. Um, and when I started work, we didn't talk about digital health, we talked about e-health. Uh, and we defined that as the use of digital technologies to improve health. Um, and you can see here a few examples of the kinds of things that we were talking about and we have talked about down the years. We've talked about some practical applications like electronic health records, uh, like electronic prescriptions, 
like telehealth, as the Veneto colleagues were mentioning a, a few moments ago, providing care remotely, um, as well as sort of system improvements and system challenges, things like electronic identifiers of patients in particular, but also of other actors within the system, and of establishing wider standards and frameworks uh, to enable different systems to, to all link together so that the information is mutually compatible, not just at a technical level, but also at a, the level of meaning and understanding and use. And we put that initially under this heading of e-health. And then the next term, I think, which, is, which came along was m-health. Um, and put very simply, I would say that this is, this is where we all discovered how useful smartphones were. Um, and so, because initially with e-health, one of the challenges was that if you think back, actually not that long ago, we were very tied to desktop computers and to big physical systems to do these kinds of things. But then wider information technology has changed and moved on hugely. And we now have very powerful small computers in many of our pockets and smartphones. And so the field expanded to include in the definition this idea of mobile devices, perhaps phones and smartphones that people might have that might track their own health, that might monitor things, that might be uh, a mechanism of, for example, making appointments, but also mobile devices for um, healthcare professionals. So things that would allow people to professionals to access information whilst they were on the move. And that might mean out on the, in the move, on the move across a community, or it might mean on the move just in different parts of a very large hospital to really try and cut down some of the, the delays between areas. And then in more recent years, this concept has been broadened again to include things like big data. And I'll come back to some examples of new sources of data and high volumes of data and new technologies such as artificial intelligence uh, and machine learning. So when we've talked in this school about digital health, we're using digital health as an overarching term that encompasses all of these uses of digital technologies, information and communication technologies, data, new machine and computing learning and machine and computing techniques, all under this overall heading of digital health. And that's the way that we're going to use the term uh, during this course. Now, I'm going to come on to talk about the pandemic and some and how that has changed our understanding, because, of course, it's changed our understanding of everything. But before I get to that, I want to talk a bit about where we were before COVID-19. What did the field of digital health look like before then? Because, as I said, we've been working on this for many years. And what has that produced? And I'm, I'm not going to go into huge detail about this for lack of time but the basic picture that we see is one where there was a lot of progress in establishing frameworks legal frameworks physical infrastructure frameworks training skills i'll come on to give you a breakdown of some of these different mechanisms a bit later on but that we see two things one there was big variation between countries about how far they made advances down this road of digital health and putting in place the right frameworks, getting digital health used in, uh, in ways that benefit patients. And we also see very enormous variation in implementation. How much is this used in practice? And that varies by country varies by condition. So you see that, for example, some areas like diabetes, where there's very constant flows of information, we see some very leading examples of, of management and use of, um, that involves digital health tools, and in some other areas, much less. But overall, the picture is of potential and of frameworks that are there, but that potential is not being fully realized in practice. And let me, let me come on to talk about why that might be. And I'm just going to swap onto um, a slide or two here just to help clarify some of that. So I'm going to use here a particular framework called the Consolidated Framework for Implementation uh, Research, the CFIR, developed by um, Laura Damschroeder and colleagues. You have the reference down on one bottom uh, side of the slide. Oh, by the way, don't worry about taking 
hugely detailed notes. I mean, please do take notes during, <laughs> during this school, but we will make this presentation and the notes that you're seeing in this lecture available on the website in a PDF format. So you'll also have access, for example, to these different um, detailed references afterwards. So this consolidated framework for implementation research, you can see the overall structure on the, um, on the right hand side there. So you start with whatever this e-health tool is that we're talking about, then it's the individuals who try and who are going to use it. The inner setting, which I interpret as the sort of the organization, the hospital or the GP practice or the workplace where we're trying to adopt this set, this um, tool and the outer setting, the overall wider system and context. And then Ross and colleagues have done a systematic review of systematic reviews um, to look at factors that influence the implementation of what they've termed e-health here according to these different areas. And then there are two messages that I would like you to take out from this slide. So the first of all is the overall framework here is a nice way of breaking down some of the different challenges. And I think you can, you can see here on the screen some of the different challenges that are involved. But the second message, and this really is one of the things which I would I'd want to underline in any discussion about digital health tools, is that it, although we are tempted to focus on the technology, we're, fo we're tempted to focus on the characteristics of the tool itself, how it works technically, what its performance is, the software, the hardware. Actually, if you look at this list, most of the factors that affect how successfully these tools are used in practice is not the technology. It's the wider personal, organizational and system context and the process of support and engagement and implementation that's involved to try and put these tools into practice. That's a very clear message from the, from the literature and from now more than a, probably a good couple of decades of experience. And I think it's a point that's really worth underlining. And I think if you bear that in mind, you'll see those themes coming back during some of the specific example presentations that we're going to have during this week. So if we then come on to some of the policy mechanisms that we might use to try and influence this, uh, this implementation, again, this is a framework, this one's mine, um, that we might want to use to just structure our thinking about some of the different tools that we can use at the policy and the system level to help try and address these challenges. And I divide these up into four, these four quadrants of regulatory mechanisms, so legal frameworks or licensing, financial tools and mechanisms. How do we pay for care? Does the payment include or incentivize digital health tools or digital health services, for example? Quality, we're going to hear about how can you help improve the training, the skills, the benchmarking, the standards. How can we tell when we're doing digital health well and how can we tell when digital health is actually better than other forms of, of tools or when it adds value? And then technical aspects, things like the standards that I mentioned earlier and this key word of interoperability, how to get the different parts of these digital health tools to talk to each other and the different standards and systems uh, that we put in place in the form of infrastructure in order to help that. And I'm gonna come on to talk about some of these different uh, tools when we come to the challenges during the pandemic. Before I do that though, I just want to underline one other thing which comes across very clearly, which is the theme of inequalities. Now, we talk a lot about inequalities in access to digital care. One of the things that's quite often said is that this is something which is quite age dependent. You know, older people are less good at using digital um, technologies. It has to be said, when you look at the literature, that's not really the picture that you find. Um, and I don't know about you, but I, I have plenty of grandparents and older people in my family who, when it comes to being able to talk to their grandchildren during the pandemic, have proved to be able to use digital technologies just fine, thank you very much. Um, but what we have seen is a lot of inequalities in access linked to abilities to access digital services more generally. So do you have the right kind of technology, for example, to be able to access websites and other tools and platforms? How are you able to access the internet? And in a sense, being able to access digital technologies 
maybe be is becoming another social determinant of health. So digital access as a social determinant of wider health mechanisms. Now, I started out by saying I wanted to talk about the COVID-19 pandemic, and I want to briefly go through, well, what has this changed about this overall picture that we talked about? So what we see when we've looked at what's happened across the European region, which is part of what we've done in this policy brief, is we see tools being used under these four major headings. And I think what I'm going to say here is probably going to be quite familiar to you all in terms of following the use of different tools during the pandemic. So I'm not going to go through it in huge detail. I guess I just think of this as just illustrating some examples for you just to bear in mind as we go through the week and thinking about different applications of uh, digital health tools. There's some obvious stuff. Governments and administrations and other actors have needed to share information that's been changing rapidly as quickly as possible. And so there's been some very basic use of terms of websites and applications to do that. There's also been a lot of efforts to combat misinformation, and that's included not just providing information and doing things like engaging, engaging through social media. It's also included some more advanced techniques like chatbots and automated responses and tracking of social media messages through automated tools. So there's been some interesting new and perhaps innovative technologies that have been used to help combat misinformation. Monitoring and surveillance, a lot of this has been adaptation and expansion of existing surveillance tools, many of which use digital platforms anyway. But one of the things that we've seen has been an increase in speed. So in the past, we've perhaps wanted to, or been willing to see uh, provision of data that takes maybe months or years, but we've all wanted to see data about COVID much, much quicker. And so new systems have had to be developed that have provided greater speed and been able to cope with greater volume in terms of surveillance tools. I mentioned earlier in relation to our big data and new sources of data, we've seen in particular to tracking restrictions, for example, the use of innovative sources of data such as map searches, mobility data, data from transport providers. We've seen data from social media tracking things like um, risks and symptoms in particular populations or communications around misinformation about the disease or about vaccination. We've seen new tools such as genomic surveillance, which has really come of age in some ways during the, um, uh, the surveillance of this particular pandemic. So monitoring and surveillance, both in terms of tools and also in terms of new sources of data. And of course, contact tracing apps, which have been much discussed, although it has to be said, it's still unclear how effective they are. And it certainly seems clear that they don't replace the need for what's sometimes called shoe leather epidemiology basic person-to-person -person contact tracing. We talked earlier about telemedicine, about supporting the provision of health services, either for COVID or other types of health services. So there's been a widespread shift to remote consultations and management. There's been a much greater and more dynamic use of information platforms to manage capacity within health systems. And there's been uh, some use made of innovative information technology tools to be able to generate information and do research about the pandemic in very quick time. And we're going to hear more about at least one of those examples, the recovery trial, later on during the week. And now that we're getting to the stage of vaccination and tracking immunity within the population, we've seen digital health tools used in this enormous logistical effort supporting the vaccine rollout as tools for demonstrating vaccination or immunization status, and also in terms of monitoring, again, monitoring reactions, using everything from social media to very, very rapid reporting systems within health systems to track adverse reactions uh, to the vaccine, for example. In my last couple of minutes, just to reassure Reinhardt and Demi, um, I just wanna raise a couple of questions that you might like to think about as we go on through the school. So I started out this presentation in reviewing the situation in regard to digital health by describing it in terms of unfulfilled potential, that a huge amount of work has been done, but actually we weren't maybe making use of digital health tools as far as we could be. 
within European health systems. And we've seen during COVID a huge shift towards making more use of digital health tools. So one key question for as we go forward is how can we build on that momentum? How can we keep what we've found valuable? And how can we ensure that we perhaps return to those things where actually digital health was very much a suboptimal solution in a temporary period? And how are we going to know the difference? How do we gather the evidence that will enable us to know what we should be keeping and what we should be letting go? We've shown, I think, that a key issue is not the technical capacity, but the motivation to use particular tools. If I, I'm thinking of an example from here in the UK, um, we had frameworks for remote consultations in primary care. We had all the tools and the frameworks in place for years in advance of the pandemic with average usage rates of something like 1% of consultations. And then in the pandemic, usage rates have gone up to over 95% of consultations. So clearly the technology and the frameworks weren't the barrier. It was that either patients or professionals or both preferred other means of working. So how are we going to sustain making use of digital health tools? And another issue, strategic independence. I don't think it will have escaped anyone who's followed these, these issues during the pandemic that we've had to depend on uh, what was available from certain vendors. Let's be specific for contact tracing. The vast bulk of contact tracing apps have depended on what two American companies, Apple and Google, have been willing to cooperate with in their technology platforms. How do we ensure appropriate frameworks in place for commercial actors and IT providers as we move forward. So my final points summarized here, digital health has great potential that is not being fully used. There's been enormous progress during the pandemic, both specifically in relation to the, um, uh, the COVID-19 virus itself and for care more broadly. That organizational and system support for that change is essential, but it's not sufficient if you don't have the motivation and so how can we build on that momentum from the pandemic to help us make best use of digital health uh, technologies as we move forward? And with that, I will hand back uh, to, I think, Dimi, you maybe have been following the chat during this, uh, this period of time. And um, you will, I'm afraid I wasn't able to see what came up. So I rely on you to, to <laughs> uh, over to you to ask uh, questions and clarifications about things I didn't make clear. Thank you, Nick, um, and good afternoon also to everyone uh, from me at the observatory headquarters in Brussels. Um, there are, I think, two questions that qualify for me as, as clarification or maybe points where you can maybe briefly um, elaborate at this point, and one that I will keep for later on during the discussion. The one is, is it fair, looking at the definition you provided, to say, would it be correct to say that e-health is mostly about management information systems, MIS, while digital health goes beyond MIS to look at big data and analytics? And this is, I think, complemented by the second clarification question, or rather remark, which says that at the definition level, we should add the transformation of healthcare through digitalization. So I think these two things, for me, go together um, to say that, yeah, looking at e-health and uh, on top of uh, big data and analytics and on top we have the transformation of healthcare but I don't want to answer in your in your sense so please back to you. Thanks Dimi and they, do you know what they're, they're really interesting questions and I want to say two things so um, I think the first thing to say is to be perfectly frank there is no agreed definition here and so with the greatest possible respect to all the eminent actors in this field from the observatory side, we just came up with our own definition, which represented as good a consensus as we could come up with. But in fact, there is an entire strand of academic work, which is just simply attempting to define what is inside e-health and digital health and all the rest of this kind of stuff. So I would, abs I, I think perhaps that change in definition is representative perhaps of a, of a change of, of more change in perspective. So were we primarily talking about management information systems and for management information systems, uh, I would understand things which are focused on the administration of the system itself. And then, and over time, have we shifted to look more at broader applications for system change? I think absolutely. 
I don't think that's necessarily definitional in terms of is e-health one and m-health or digital health something else. I think it's a change in our perspective about how we make use of these um, these technologies. And the analogy I would use is, um, which has been used many times, is when we first brought uh, computing into offices, people took typewriters and brought in computers and basically used the computer as though it was just a digital typewriter. And so you're, doing, you're trying to do the same things that you were previously doing, but now you're using digital technology to do them. And to be honest, that isn't necessarily an improvement <laughs> because the digital technology is more expensive. And if you don't actually use any of its additional functionalities, then how much are you adding? And I think as time has gone on, that thought process has led us to think, well, we can do better here. We can go broader. And I think that's maybe some of the things, Reinhard, which we're going to hear about from some of the presentations that we will have from some of our colleagues. Yes, thank you, Nick. And uh, we are still at the beginning of the summer school. We, I mean, there's always a tendency that, and I see the, the, the questions in the chat and, and they are good questions. And, and you know, we, we, there is a tendency always to ask everything and try to solve everything at the beginning. We gave today's topic for us, the challenge of digital health and the shock of the pandemic. And, and we, we wanted to, to, to see, to follow with you how countries experience it. And so in, in what is now following, we have three country experiences and we were trying, I don't want to offend any country, but to, 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 to select both countries with more experience when the pandemic started in terms of digital health and countries with, with a greater room for improvement, let, let's say. And we what is following now, we have three presentations from Finland, from Italy, and from Germany. And we start in that order. So we start with Finland. And it's my pleasure to introduce to you Kerti uh, Mer Mermima. She is health system and interoperability advisor in the Ministry of Social Affairs, which is also responsible for health. Kerti, over to you, please. Thank you so much. And uh, hello, everybody, to, uh, to listen in uh, about the, the, our lessons in, in Estonia, actually. What? Uh, how? Oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry, so, uh, sorry, sorry, sorry. I, I, I was just wondering my, myself. Sorry, I'm <laughs> Estonia. Are, we are very close countries, and we have a lot in common. So that's uh, that's totally fine. Uh, however, I think that the lessons learned perhaps were a bit different. Um, I would like to share with you two um, main. Um, uh, main lessons that uh, that we learned in Estonia are how did we uh, perceive uh, the first uh, the first wave of uh, of the crisis, the first wave, and and later on how did we move on? So um, for us, um, the first uh, thing that we saw, uh, we could observe a phenomenon where, um, in one hand, the whole healthcare sector. Uh, is under very great pressure, especially from the human resources side. There, um, we could say that from the healthcare professional side, we there was there was scarcity. We, uh, there were rather scarce uh, um, resources to have enough people to take care of the patients. But in other hand, uh, we saw a sudden explosive increase in the need for data in the healthcare. Uh, firstly, to secure um, strategic crisis management, but also for um, to ensure the transparent uh, public communication about what is going on in our healthcare sector and with the COVID in Estonia. Uh, and uh, one of the lessons that we saw in in this moment was that it is very important. Uh, or it was at least for Estonia, to utilize as much as possible the already implemented digital services uh, in the healthcare sector. Uh, because as uh, we thought out um, or rationalized it, uh, would be to minimize, first of all, the costs of, uh, of developments, but also to minimize the sudden shaking changes in the healthcare processes. 
because when we what we saw was that um, when the most of the needed data is actually created and collected by the healthcare workforce, um, we in the pandemic we really need them to focus on the patients. We really uh, need them to focus uh, them to focus on the medicine, not to focus on the um, filling out the forms or uh, adapting to new changes or uh, adapting and, and uh, getting to know new scary digital school uh, digital tools so so what we tried to do was to utilize uh, at most what we already had in hand and what was uh, already uh, familiar to our healthcare uh, providers but also to the patients but the others, the other lessons that I will also uh, explain more later will be to understand the need to be inclusive and partner up as much as possible with the private sector uh, where appropriate, and, and also not to be afraid of the new innovative ways to introduce digital tools in the healthcare system. So uh, for the first lesson, uh, what we did. Um, was first of all uh, what I need to um, what I need to explain a little bit is that um, Estonia has been a very lucky country to have a well working national health information system in use since two thousand eight. Uh, what is national health information system? It's a national database uh, and a data exchange network with uh, standardization and data exchange rules. Uh, where most of Estonian medical documents are being stored and shared within all the health uh, care providers in Estonia. So during the COVID pandemic, uh, we really got to enjoy uh, the fruit of this system because um, uh, we got to use um, most, of the, most of the documents that are being shared there. Uh, most noteworthy documents that we share in the system and that we use for the COVID pandemic were, were um, patient care summaries, hospital care summaries, uh, laboratory test results, and immunization certificates that were all shared um, in our system. And uh, they're shared in this uh, national platform. So having all these documents available in a single database uh, enabled us to write algorithms uh, to filter out automatically uh, the data from the documents and automatically also put it put together the most uh, most of the COVID statistics actually. So uh, while uh, healthcare workers uh, they were able to just continue their usual processes, their usual way of work, uh, the usual documentation process, uh, and they did. We tried to minimize, and uh, in most cases, they did not get any extra documentation burden for uh, for the data needs that the country had. Uh, and thanks to that infrastructure and, and this automation process, uh, the crisis management team in Estonia uh, was using automated dashboards, uh, and uh, thanks to that, had near real time uh, detailed overview of the COVID situation in Estonia. Uh, and they were able to manage the patient flow in the hospitals, uh, deal with the governance of the crisis with minimum cost. And um, they were able to react in a quite timely manner. Um, at the same time, um, the same data was all available for patients too. Uh, so all the patients in Estonia were able to check their COVID test results online using the national health portal. Uh, and they were also, uh, since this summer, actually uh, able to generate different, different COVID certificates, uh, like a COVID vaccination certificate, negative test certificate, um, automatically online. Uh, thus significantly reducing uh, the administrative costs uh, for the system. Um, and uh, when we're talking about the vaccination, we were, a uh, were able to use the national health e-booking system that uh, was implemented just in 2019, uh, just uh, enough time uh, ago for the people to get used to the new system um, but luckily, we're able to, to use it now for the COVID situation. 
so um, uh, when the COVID vaccination was um, was uh, or let me let me put it in a better way after most of the risk patients and the frontline workers were vaccinated then we opened the, this e-booking system for vaccination appointments to all of Estonians in uh, in the early June this year uh, and so far we've had more than 200,000 uh, first dose vaccination appointments uh, now booked using this one national system which makes it much easier for patients to only look for one one system, one place to book a time for the vaccination. Uh, and uh, also, um, during the, especially during the first wave of pandemic in Estonia, it was a big question to how to minimize the physical contacts between people. Uh, and uh, in this case, we were also lucky to uh, use up two of uh, the systems in use already in Estonia. So in healthcare provision, one of the contact minimizing solution uh, pillar really uh, was of course the e-prescription system um, that was introduced already in 2010 um, and uh, and greatly uh, helped us to, to minimize the need for people to go uh, to see the doctor to get their prescri prescriptions renewed. But also during the first wave of uh, pandemic, there was a, a rather innovative, uh, a little bit risky decision made, which proved to be very successful to uh, create the possibility for people in the national patient portal to initiate their sick leave. Uh, so, so people did not have to go see the doctor or call up the doctor, but they were able to initiate the COVID-19 sick leave through the patient portal automatically. Uh, so, so this really helped to reduce the burden of the primary healthcare. Uh, at first, when when there was really the country was in a shock of uh, what is going to happen, and uh, are we really really ready for that? But as for the second lesson, um, we really needed to look into how do we usually create these digital tools uh, on the country level. Um, and it was a very uh, good lesson for us to really um, understand a little bit of out-of-the-box public-private partnership uh, ways. And, uh, and it was a very good lesson for us to learn that this crisis was not just only the crisis of public health or um, crisis of public sector uh, or healthcare system. Um, it was really time for all the sectors to come together and solve problems together that everybody is facing uh, and taking measures together, um, not prioritizing profit uh, over the gain, the shared gain of society. So um, what we saw in Estonia was that uh, only one day after uh, the lockdown started in Estonia last year, uh, in March, uh, private sector initiate um, uh, initiators organized uh, two very important uh, hackathons, Hack the Crisis, and later on uh, Fighting our Global Crisis hackathons, where all the different sectors, public sector, private sector, uh, and uh, also third sector, work together to create in a very short period of time different solutions to tackle the crisis, to help to fight the crisis. And uh, what we learned was that some really good scalable solutions did come out from uh, these hackathons uh, that are actually still used in Estonia uh, and uh, by the public sector or by the hospitals and the people. Uh, namely, for example, a solution called VAB uh, that connects available healthcare workforce uh, with uh, organizations needing short time uh, extra help. And also, for example, a solution called MUSK. Uh, that assists with uh, personal protective uh, equipment planning and procurement in Estonia. And also uh, from the side of contract tracing apps, uh, Estonia um, took away of cooperation between public and private uh, sector. And um, what we saw that we created this app uh, in a cooperation with the uh, Estonian Ministry of uh, 
social affairs and 12 IT and design companies uh, on a very voluntary based uh, way, uh, which made it possible to uh, create this app with very marginal costs uh, compared to many other nations. So uh, going back, uh, the two main lessons that Estonia was really dealing with, uh, especially during the beginning of the pandemic, was to make maximum use of the digital health infrastructure in place, not to create a bigger shock, uh, and to maximize uh, the investments that are already made, but also not to be afraid of new ways to procure and uh, develop new digital tools. Thank you so much. Thank you, Katy. Um, uh, maybe I should, I think the audience already sees clearly, I mean, you could build on what you already had. And I think we can come back later that clearly your starting point was better than in many other countries. Dimi, you are still following the chat. Do we have any direct questions? Yes, indeed I am. No, we don't have any direct questions. I have one, but I'll keep it for the panel. Okay, thank you. So we now move on to Silvio Brusa-Ferro. He is not only a colleague, he's a professor of hygiene and preventive medicine, but above all, he has two important functions in the Italian health system since 2019. He's president of the Higher Institute of Health, and during the COVID um, crisis he not only became a member but the spokesperson of the technical scientific committee to advise the government in covid related things and i think it's um it's clearly very pertinent the iss is the abbreviation here uh, for the uh, for this higher institute of health and that we hear about the role this one played in the decentralized regional health system of italy over over to you silvio Oh, thank you very much. Thank you very much for inviting me to share some of the experience we live that we are living still at the moment. Of course, you know, uh, digital health is one of the challenges we have to face and also the great opportunity we have. So what I try to do in the next uh, 10 minutes uh, is just to share with you some of the experience we live and through them. I try to focus on some critical on also opportunity that uh, uh, emerged from this uh, pandemic we are living now just from you know more than one and a half year um, some few aspects to 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 share with you italy was the first uh, western european western country that to face the the transmission and to face in a, was hit very heavily at the, right from the beginning, since the epidemic started immediately in Lombardy and partly in Veneto, northern part of Italy. And uh, the number were very high in the very few days. We had to face an epidemic uh, with the proportion that we never saw in the past. Uh, that means that we had to organize an approach, quite an emergency system, and also to at the same time to support preparedness for facing this, uh, this epidemic for the next months. And uh, this is the first, one of the first slides we use in the past, uh, just to show you that the, right from the beginning, the epidemic was uh, confined in some part of Italy, mostly in the Northern part of Italy. And uh, also the central part, central Italy and the southern, uh, as well as the island, were you know uh, uh, at the moment were not hit from this uh, pandemic. Um, the, looking from a perspective of digital health, uh, we had two or three challenges to face. The first one was we were the icebreakers, so. Some of the measures we adopted were the first time were adopted in the Western country and democratic uh, organization. And uh, we had to face an institutional synergy. And this is very particularly true and particularly critical aspect, uh, since as you know, probably in Italian national health system is organized to regional health system, is the putting together regional systems that work together in their national system. So, the dialectic existing between regions and central and uh, Ministry of Health, National Ministry of Health, is were uh, part of the dialectic existing before the pandemic, but still during the pandemic uh, was declined, even if more efficiently. Um, 
this uh, made evident the need to give a strong, fast, and a coherent response, and uh, as well as to set up data collection that should be shared uh, quite uh, daily uh, with all the regions and uh, with this common standards. And we were successful on that. Well, I think MAS is one of the recent most effective successes in this kind of activity that Italy achieved. And the other thing is the population. And the population means uh, information, means also acceptability, means also uh, ability to uh, adhere to their recommended, uh, recommended restrictions. And finally, I will just uh, stress a little bit the experience we leave that National Institute of Health about training. That is, I think, one of the part very much interesting uh, also for the, for the uh, present and for the future. This is in short, the, the, the curve, as you see, starting from mid of uh, February, exactly the 20s, we found the first uh, out the first case in uh, autochthonous case in, in Codogno, in uh, Lombardy, we saw the number were rapidly growing. And in a few days, we adopted the, the, what we call now the red zones. Uh, I just want to remember that, uh, or to stress that the red zones uh, uh, in the way we adopted at that time was an extraordinary measure. It's not extraordinary in itself since we have a, a historical experience you know, from the Republic of Venice, the Serenissima, they adopted uh, centuries ago similar uh, measures. But in the Western countries, uh, uh, giving or, or uh, you know, imposing this, this kind of measure was a, a, absolutely an extraordinary system. But right from that moment, uh, the communication started to have a very quick development and the sharing of data had to be set up in very few hours in, in few hours and we were able in few days to provide the reports all over the world and make them public in our website then we saw you see that we had the, the, the lockdown at the national level and then uh, it was successful and uh, from may to the last three of the last year we starting uh, to release the measure and then we have the second wave in October as well uh, as the other uh, European countries. And but that case in the second wave as well as the third wave at the beginning of this uh, year, uh, the distribution in the country was homogeneously uh, homogeneous was not more uh, any more a northern uh, Italian problem, but was a all over Italian problem. Uh, the one of the issues about digital health is that uh, we had a, a, you know, an epidemic of information, uh, someone called them infodemic. And this is still one of the critical issues we, we are living uh, with regard to, to vaccine, for, for instance, to vaccination or to the use of green certificate. And uh, the other big issue uh, still existing as the, in Italy is that we, had, we need a uh, in an institutional cooperation, meaning that there are many institutions, many ministries, many authorities, they had, to, they had to work together in order to be successful. And this is an, one of the first uh, as critical aspects I, I want to stress in this, in this presentation is that uh, being many data distributed in different agency, at least in Italy, the sharing of this data is not easy. And uh, I want to introduce another variable, at least, uh, I think that is quite existing all over in Europe, but still, uh, but in Italy is very, is very relevant. Is that the authority, the privacy on, the authority on privacy and the, the rules uh, made the difference in some cases, for, for instance, for the tracking application, the use of tracking application that in Italy had the name Immuni, that was, you know, determined in, the, in, our, in its performances by the rules uh, adopted or recommended by this authority. Um, then the specificity of our experience was this, the institution, because of the emergency state that was declared starting right from the beginning of February 2020, or what we call CTS, that is Scientific Advisory Board, that is a, a team of uh, experts uh, advising the, the government about some measure to adopt uh, about uh, the comments on epidemiology status or the evolution of epidemiology status. Um, this is the role of the, uh, our institution. 
I want to stress a little bit this because a part of many of the activities we are doing are related to uh, uh, related to digital health. You know, the first is of course monitoring and assessment planning, ensuring scenarios. Uh, as a preparedness, part of the preparedness, and all of them are public and are, are in, uh, available in our website. The, the second one is about uh, epidemiology, so setting up database, uh, flow data flows among regions, standardize them, validate them, control the quality of them, both for you know diagnostic and epidemiological aspect. And this is another part that you know uh, means that you have to. Uh, cross-check through digital activities. Then uh, was about, uh, you know, epidemiology and uh, molecular epidemiology and then sequencing. That is still another part that is part of, you know, uh, of database at a global level, but still at the national level, we have a set, a website where we upload the sequences and then we share them with the, the global community. But this is another very important issue in during pandemic. And, uh, Analysis of medical records is very much important. We did some analysis about the dead people, but this is another important issue that uh, needs perhaps to improve an improvement since clinical records are very much important if they can be centralized or if they can be assessed by the artificial intelligence. At the moment, we are very disingenuously this homogeneous in the use of these tools, and this make very much difficult to make analysis on them. Um, the other thing is the communication the information. I will come back again on that, but this is another very important issue. So, you know, starting from the epidemic intelligence activities and try to counterfeit, you know, fake news and the issue like and issue like that, as well as to to train, to inform, to make available evidence in uh, real time since that the, this during this pandemic the evidence is grow grew at day by day but today grow they grow today by day by day and so making them reading them evaluating them including them in the protocols in the active in the recommendation we release and this is the reason why we published more than 40 45 uh, ad interim recommendation ad interim meaning that they are updating according to the availability of new evidences. Um, the other thing is training and of course also. Uh, Silvio, the, you uh, already had 10 minutes, so please try okay. to come to try the final. To fi finalize, yes. Uh, just to show you this uh, important thing I want uh, about the distribution. The first one is the experience we have about uh, training. Uh, what we discovered needing to train a lot of people in a very short time and having not the possibility to, to work in presence. We just developed our uh, distance learning approach and uh, we had the opportunity to train more than half a million of professionals. And that was just amazing, the number of one. And there were all the courses released credits. And this is very much important. I see in the future digital health, and training for that is will be very much important. The second thing I want to stress before closing is that uh, we set up a, a website about uh, a, to counterfeit the fake news. And this is a, another very much important, is just for normal people, but it's very, very much important for the uh, newspapers, for journalists, they want to know some more about the scientific evidence. Finally, that's key keywords. We have a lot of opportunities for uh, digital uh, digital activities. And uh, of course, we have uh, about uh, the progress of digitalization, you know, the recovery plan in Italy would be much one, a large part of the resources will be uh, invested for digitalization. But, uh, you know, we have to think as about uh, as a network and imagine data that can be shared, even in big countries, regionalized as, Ita as Italy is at the moment, we should do that. Finally, I want to stress the role we have to think about of authorities and privacy authorities is a something important in determining 
how we can share data, how we can send data, how we can analyze data, overall uh, data related to health, both of the single persons and the, the communities. Uh, this is the website where you can find in English also most of the activity we are just had in a short time, uh, time uh, opportunity to present, but of course you can find that uh, they are much more about it. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you, Silvio, for this uh, insight from the first affected European uh, country of the pandemic. Dimi, I just checked the chat. I think there's nothing. Indeed. I okay. would say that, of course, we have a lot of substantive questions for Silvio, but those can come later. We come, we come back to them later. So last but not least, we turn to Germany. And it's my pleasure to introduce to you Henrik uh, Mattis. Henrik is the uh, managing director of the still relatively new health, in health innovation hub, which I'm sure he will explain. And he's coming from a different background because he's a developer of health apps um, and he has received uh, several awards for his innovations coming from this side. And, and I thank you, Hendrik, for being with us and probably also some complementarity in, in your approach and what we did in Germany. And I, I'm sure most people know that we had a that we were behind Estonia, for example, when it comes to the digital health. But over to you. It's very fair to say that we are behind Estonia and probably the vast majority of the other European countries. Thank you very much for, for having me. And it's my pleasure to share our experiences, which are not too different to what we just heard about Italy. It's interesting to, to hear all the similarities in, in that regard. Um, let me start maybe by, by explaining first who we are. We are a team of 12 experts all the, uh, coming from all parts of the healthcare system. So we are not a kind of government people, but we are from the uh, healthcare practice. I have a background in developing digital health applications, but I've also my team uh, data scientists, but also pharmacists, um, med medical lawyers, and many others. We consult the uh, governments, but also all stakeholders uh, on all relevant topics around digitization. And this can be inpatient care, outpatient care. It was a lot around COVID-19, of course, um, but we have quite a broad um, perspective on that. So if speaking about Germany, it helps to understand where we're coming from. Uh, the German healthcare system still very much runs on the fax machine and on pen and paper. And if you looked into uh, any of those rankings uh, recently, um, especially before 2019, we usually ranked very, very badly. There is simply no digital infrastructure in place to build upon. And I will outline what we did, although there was an infrastructure in place, but also if I have the time in the end to show you a bit what is going on currently in Germany, because we tried to change a lot of that. Um, and in that regard, um, in fact, since 2018, we passed 28 laws. Um, all with digital health components and six of those laws, mainly focusing on digitization of digitization of inpatient care, outpatient care, uh, and, and many, many other aspects. So what we tried in the past three years, and this is on us, we just consulted the, the Ministry of Health, but very much the Ministry of Health, is to make sure that at least we, in the near future, will have a digital health infrastructure in place that all stakeholders know of the importance of digitization, not as a means in, the, in itself, but as a, as, as, as um, Kathy and, and, and Silvio just outlined, as a necessary basis to act significantly faster and more efficient to a pandemic, but also in general to, to all the healthcare uh, uh, topics. So when COVID-19 hit us, it was in the middle of this reform agenda. And um, as there was no infrastructure in place, what we tried to get an overview of this puzzle um, by mapping out the, the corona patient journey, how, how, we, um, how we saw it, and I don't want to go into all details, just highlighting a few examples that may help you to understand what, what we did. Um, first of all, not new to most of the healthcare systems participating today, but completely new to the German healthcare system, we, um, we, we developed a Corona chatbot together with a partner to just show that those 
massive amount of, of uh, calls and emails and, and, and whatsoever that reach to the healthcare institution that could not be handled by humans anymore, uh, that there are uh, technical infrastructure in place that could very much help them. And this was then quickly adopted by many um, uh, health insurance uh, uh, institutions. Um, Katie just outlined the hackathons. Uh, we were not the first, but um, by then um, we organized within five days the largest hackathon ever having taken place until then with uh, 27,000 volunteers. Uh, I mentored all the uh, initiatives that tried to support the public health um, authorities. As Sylvia outlined for Italy, very much also for Germany, we have a very complex situation that um, health is usually a domain of the federal states and the, the um, uh, uh, government um, has only limited uh, uh, access or, or coordination function in place. So we had to coordinate those 16 federal states and all of their health um, care uh, activities and they are responsible for the public health. Systems. So um, it was a challenge to just get an overview the variety of solutions in place um, on the local um, on the local uh, ground. Uh, they used a variety of IT systems, had different processes. There was no interoperability or whatsoever. And um, at least we managed to now get more than 30 initiatives um, from the nonprofit sector to support those public health institutions in their daily work with, uh, with IT, with apps, with um, uh, data solutions, and as much. Um, what is the um, Robert Koch Institute, which is our uh, main or our, our leading um, national health institution for pandemics, who um, issued their very first app. And I think they had an app before which targeted children with some basic information, but this, is, this was the first real interactive app um, where we asked our citizens to donate their healthcare data and their location so that we can better understand early on when people's health vital parameters change. Um, and it's of course always COVID, but back then it was a very good indicator to understand when new herds may arise. And, and um, as I said, it was the first kind of mass market app that the Robert Koch Institute issued. And within a few days, we had more than a half a million active participants. Never happened before. And what why, why I'm giving you this, is, this example is for me, Corona pretty much helped also the institutions to understand how they have to prepare to better use digital health and, and, and the many tools to, for example, know uh, if they have an App Store uh, account in place, who is responsible for the App Store account, um, where to get developers, how to do products, uh, digital product marketing and management and so on. So really a, a, an array of topics which was pretty new, at least to many of the German health institutions. Then, of course, you all have the Corona warning and, and tracing apps. Uh, likewise, in Germany, it took us more than 10 weeks of public debate um, to, to finally um, come through and, 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 and decide that we also need such an app that it's not against our super high data privacy and there's security concerns here in Germany, Public opinion was pretty much, it's a super expensive gadget. No one is ever going to use it. Luckily, um, they were proven wrong. Yes, it's expensive, but we have more than 26 million downloads, which is pretty unique um, also compared to many other countries where it's not mandatory. Um, step by step, it was also integrated with what I outlined as a corona patient journey before. So the labs have now access to it. You can. Um, uh, you can warn uh, other uh, citizens, of course, uh, you can upload your test results you can uh, that just happened recently. And again, this is not the perfect product, but what is very encouraging for me is that somehow, although we in Germany especially are very complicated with data privacy, we managed to have one central app issued kind of by the government, which is used by a vast majority of the population. If they now have a first understanding of what digital health may be for their everyday life, and this is a very good basis to build upon any other um, uh, concluding um, uh, 
uh, digital health uh, activities may be an electronic record or medication or whatsoever. So we, we did really the first step on a mass market scale. Um, if you look to um, telemedicine, we had just kind of passed a few months before all necessary laws to allow the physicians to use telemedicine. Before that, it was pretty much banned for decades. Um, but it was not interesting for, for, for the vast majority of physicians because they stick to what they knew. And this was uh, 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 the, the private practice. But thanks to Corona, and only by this, I always call it an exogenous shock, um, within six months, the a number of physicians using telemedicine completely exploded. This would never have happened. All the physicians and doctors in Germany would have no, still no experience with digital health and this, all this technology bit, if not for COVID-19. And the big question is if this is going to persist or not. Well, it's mixed. If you look into the figures in greater detail, <coughs> you see that the um, physicians in the mental health uh, uh, sphere are very active using it. The, the GPs, the majority is still not very much into it. The specialists are ever using it a bit more often. So it's a mixed uh, picture and it's not, uh, it's not that from now on telemedicine is just there to stay. But what I would argue is everyone has done a lot of, um, uh, has, has very much drawn on the experience curve. The physicians know what it's good for, what it's maybe not so good for, how to integrate it into their daily practice. We are a significant step um, um, quick summary on this end, and then if I have some more time, I would outline what else we are doing at the moment on the digital health uh, level uh, that may support all those developments. What I would argue, what you really need is leadership. We have a minister who's very ambitious to show that we can digitize here in Germany, and he was going into a, a lot of contexts. You need a text decision making level, and to be honest, in Many um, institutions, this is challenging because you usually have experts in their fields, but who had not too many touch points with um, digital health or technology uh, overall in that sense, especially not if it's also. Um, you need a timing sense of urgency, definitely. It helps if you have some uh, sparing partner to, and also as a policy maker, to um, and give you outline that they also had this, this, this um, premium of six people. You need a secure infrastructure, which we so far did not have in place. Um, as I outlined, you need time because society needs to discuss all of that and they need to agree, at least if it's um, non, not mandatory, but um, uh, to be used voluntarily. Um, and maybe also in parallel to, to Italy, if you do not have the key stakeholders organized on a federal level, it's super complicated to get your grip on it. And communicate to them, to interact with them, to, to motivate them to, to one um, goal. So, um, that, this is really crucial, I would argue. And interestingly, we have a very vibrant but constructive hacker scene. So it's the Chaos Computer Club. And they used to hack the Corona Warning app from day one to make sure that it is as safe as possible. Maybe uh, not... not um, Intuitive in, in the beginning, but if you have those hackers on a constructive level, it's very much assuring the public that the, in this case, Corona Warning app or whatever digital health application you have is as safe as possible. And I think, I fear I already used my 10 minutes. Yes, thank you all. I think you should all come on, uh, turn on your cameras now, and we will try to discuss these these issues. I if think we what have we have a sorry. Two clarification sorry? questions for Henry. Okay. Oh, sorry. Yes, sorry. Yes, I was jumping ahead here. Yes, Dimi. No go problem. Ahead. Um, one is about the um, uh, the group behind the Health Innovation Hub, and a colleague is pointing out that there don't seem to be any public health experts, perhaps linked to the fact that it was conceived before the pandemic, but is that maybe going to change? Um, and the second one is on the data donation that you mentioned, whether that was completely voluntary and what the... Um, Assurance was that the data was going to be kept safe. I think probably second part rather for the panel, but the first part about the voluntary nature, maybe quickly. So the Health Innovation App was inaugurated in early 2019 and we will dissolve end of this year. 
So it was um, uh, set up for the uh, for the challenges inside, and COVID nineteen was not a challenge inside. So no, we did not have any uh, public health expert, unfortunately, to be honest. Um, but we have a very strong tech uh, expertise in our team, so we helped all those public health institutions um, during the pandemic. We we were kind of the, the tech task force in, in many regards. And I am quite sure that when the new government, because we will have elections uh, this fall, when the new government decides to have another version of, of us in, in for the next legislation, that they will also include someone from the public health field. Now, in terms of the um, data donation app, yes, you always have biases in there. Um, and, and it may not be accurate on a, on a super individual level, but as soon as you reach a certain level of big data, and I would argue 500,000 people do copy that, um, then accuracy will be um, pretty much improved or the, the biases that you have are kind of diminished. So this is also not used to execute directly actions on it, but it's, it's a very good kind of trend barometer to understand where the likelihood of, of new infection hurts may rise and it's an early warning system so you usually have two to three days before actually the people um, start to go into the hospitals so you could warn the hospitals and again it's not a hundred percent accuracy level but it's at least something additionally that we would not have otherwise good thank you for these clarifications and i heard we i think we heard four excellent examples starting with Nick's o overview what are we talking about what is digital health versus e-health and, and, and so on with all the challenges in clearly finding a term and knowing what we what we talk about and then three country examples with different starting positions and today remember it's the first day of the of, of the of the summer school we are basically looking backwards and say okay where were we when this all started well then towards the week we then say at, at the end of the week okay what does this now mean but i'm sure we cannot disentangle this uh, this this totally but um and I don't want to, I mean, Dimi, I think we still had some questions which you wanted to put on, on hold. Maybe now it's the time to bring them back up again yeah. as, as, as a starter. Yes, I think we, ha we have several um, and some, many of them are interlinked with different perspectives. I think perhaps um, we start with this understanding and realization that we had different starting points um, and ask ourselves why that is the case, uh, why it is the case that in some countries, digital health was far more ahead in terms of implementation when the pandemic started in comparison to others. Um, and in that respect, we have one question that uh, asks whether, for example, the delayed implementation in Germany had to do with the structure of the healthcare system. And I think Henrik already mentioned this a little bit. But another thing that has come a couple of times um, in the chat is the issue of motivation. Uh, Nick brought that up. Um, the issue of motivation uh, and how it can be a contributing factor for implementation. So I think maybe the first question to, add, to think about is whose motivation that is, what are the contributing factors? Is it policymakers who are motivated to implement and maybe to reimburse? Is it practitioners in the health system? And we have colleagues in the chat saying they are administrators and telemedicine platforms and clinicians don't have time, so they don't have motivation. Is it patients to, for the uptake, for example, of patient facing apps? And in that respect, um, how do also um, inequalities factor in? So I think I stop for now and then uh, we come back for, for more. Maybe seeing as I, I started the trouble on that, maybe I go first, if that's okay. Yes, you, it's okay. Yeah, yeah okay. Um, and then the, the maybe other colleagues will come in from their national experiences. Um, so I think, I guess what I really wanted to underline with that question of motivation, um, in another framework, which I didn't use today, we, we talked about the phrase, the value proposition. And what I mean by that is, why is, the, why is making the shift from the way you work now to working in a different way with the digital health tool a good thing for you, whoever you is? And one of, there was an earlier question, Dimi, which was about, you know, what, did the early stages of digital health, was this about management information systems, i.e. was for this the benefit of the people running the health system at the center? Because one of the early problems that we had was that 
the the work was being done by in particular nurses who were having to put information into quite complex not very user-friendly systems and the benefit was being felt by completely other people yeah so if the work is being done by one set of people and the benefits being felt somewhere else then obviously the people who have to do the work don't want to do the work because why do they get anything out of this so i think what we see not just in health but in lots of other sectors is that people in general are very open to the idea that digital tools and modern tools can help in principle, but they need to see why it's useful and relevant for them in this case here and now. And especially when you deal with health, you know, that people are maybe slightly nervous about, you know, if, if it doesn't work, it really matters. And so I really want to see why this is useful for me here. And that's what I mean. I guess that's what I was getting at with this term of motivation. So it's not simply enough to say here you have something that is technologically potentially useful, but it has to bring something for all the people who you want to change, who you want to do something different. I can see some of the colleagues reacting. I don't know if, if you... If yeah, I, I think we, we, we before we pass on, I think this is a very important thing because I was attacked once. I remember when I showed my physician colleagues a pen and said, this is also a, a tool for physicians. And I mean, if you refuse to put anything down, even in handwritten, why should you put it down only because it's it's digital? Or what? Why why would you start with an with an electronic patient record if you didn't have a handwritten patient record exactly. before? So I, th I think we and this this is maybe also what what I hope colleagues can bring into um, and 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 Katy Katy that is maybe one of the things which we from outside Estonia always thought. I mean, how did you? bring about the spirit that people are on board at least that's what we think from the outside that they are all on board well certainly if i really second uh, what nick said about the uh, motivation and, uh, and the value proposition because in a in estonia when we started all this uh, digitalization of of health data and health records really it the the value proposition that the healthcare workers saw was that i finally know what what my colleagues from a, from a different hospital or a, of a different primary care uh, center are doing or or when my patient comes i don't need to ask everything over and i know something already before they arrive um, however when we move on from from these patient summaries or laboratory test results that are um, everybody understands why it's so good to to share this information when we when we're moving on to more detailed data when we are moving on to more real-time data sharing, then we already see in Estonia that it's not that easy to implement. Uh, the changes are very hard to, to bring forward because the question is someone has to put into the system this detailed data. And oftentimes uh, it's, it's not that easy to automate the data, um, the data um, um, like, how do you put like the data input or or the data collection that the data is being created oftentimes in people's head not in the machine so machines is easy to to automate but how can we make it easier for the people documenting to document easier and this is often the question that is being left unsolved when we're talking about um, the documentation or or further on dig digitalization the healthcare uh, and the other part is also the the whole process the thing is there is there is no such thing as just digitalization standing on its own it always has a is is it's a part of the process if there's no change in the process then there is no value brought out of the digitalization it actually makes things much more harder for for everybody involved however what we see in estonia is that there needs to be this extra motivation extra help to find motivation for the process change also. It doesn't come just, um, in theory, people are open for the process change, but if you put it in real life, uh, people need time to adapt, people need time to try out, play out, um, just to test the systems before they can put their trust into it. And especially medical fields where we cannot really afford any mistakes. People really need time to adapt and, and take it slowly, but, for the digital health enthusiasts, 
it, it takes too long time. So we want to implement everything in one go. So, so we really, um, I really do think that it's very important to think of uh, uh, of the value that it's bringing to all the all the sites, all the different uh, participants of the health sector, and and also the user friendliness of uh, of the people using the systems. If the if the system is user friendly, if the system is intuitive, uh, it really makes your life easier, and people are willing to adopt it much faster. Um, also from the patient side. Um, if if the user friendliness of the systems is bad uh, it, and it's clumsy and it takes longer time to to use to understand uh, and if there are just random buttons on the on the screen that if you accidentally click everything is gonna explode or or disappear or close then then of course it's very scary to use so so this is also something that that we more than before are now putting our effort into. Yes, thank you. Yes, thank you, Kathy. Maybe Silvio, I mean, I, I'm sure, I mean, Italy is also a relatively conservative country when it comes to the physician and their roles. I mean, has this visibly changed during the COVID period? Well, I, I think that is about, uh, depends on what kind of digital health we are speaking. So we are speaking about uh, medical records or healthcare records is not changing a little bit because platforms are different. And uh, the other most important thing is that uh, uh, the system is regionalized. So database is mostly regionalized. And within regions we have, you know, because of the privacy authorities, every seat, each citizen has to sign their authorization to share data not just, uh, of course, with the uh, ISO or her own uh, GPs, but also with our hospital or other regional hospitals. And this is very, very much difficult. So since people is not really confident about uh, what they are signing, and so t t there are some attitude not to sign the agreement to share data. This is, you know, something incredible to, uh, we have to, to inform, uh, perhaps to you adopt the more, easy and more clear rules to share this kind of data. Um, I think the success story that we lived in Italy during this pandemic was the, is the fact that we share uh, epidemiological data between among regions and between regions and, and um, our institution. So I think in, it's the first time in the last years, at least, that we have uh, daily updated databases about new cases, car their characteristics, and so on. But still in these cases, when we are called from, you know, other scientists to share data, we have to uh, ask the authority what we can share, if we can share, and so it's very much complicated. And, and once we, you are in front of the other database, for instance, vaccinations database that is just up to the Minister of Health, we perform, we, if we need to, share, as we do, share this data, is we have to ask for an authorization. Having, in few words, is is very much difficult to share data. I think that the attitude is positive. Uh, technically, because of now the distance that uh, uh, COVID imposed, many physicians and many teams are answered by WhatsApp, by other kind of tools, and the, patient, the, the dialogue doctors and nurses, patients, was very effective also through these tools. But of course, they were not legal, let's say, let's say authorized. So that's so the people just sharing a lot of data, I think the attitude is positive, as well as the doctor. But once you come into your official position, it's very much more difficult. And I think this gap is very much important, as well as the gap in sharing data between or among different regional databases. I, think, I mean, I think we can all as non-Italians say that if we were on, on the San Servolo Island for the summer school, I remember I always had to sign a form for the hotel and you never know what you sign. They say you have to sign it. And you say, yeah, but why do you have, why do I have to sign it to you, allow it to you that you simply take down my, my name that I have been in, in your hotel, which is, and they say, yeah, but it's a European data protection law. And there was a question in the chat, maybe we can come back to that later, that Every country is interpreting this completely differently. Um, Hen Hendrik, over over to 
to you maybe coming back you saw also some of the comments people are very interested also in in the, in the german experience and and with this health innovation hub and probably i don't know i mean at the beginning maybe you also have the feeling that you were not very well known did it help to get more interest in, in digitalization the pandemic I very much agree with Nick, Katia, Silvio, what, what they just outlined. Um, clinicians are skeptic if someone from outside wants to change their routines because they are so happy that finally they have a routine that is working and saving lives. And technology, at least in Germany for, for the past decades, has never fulfilled their promises and was always a pain in their um, backs. And um, thus, you need to have a clear value proposition. You need to have a high level of usability, which is pretty much unknown, unfortunately, in, in healthcare IT in Germany. Um, if I would have to use those uh, products every day, I would go crazy. So I fully understand anyone who is reluctant to any additional technology. The one change that I would argue COVID-19 has brought is that suddenly people from outside, from like, Business to consumer products mindsets have brought their solutions into healthcare. And suddenly, all the clinicians, physicians, but also patients realize a completely different reality is possible. And they start to question why do we still have the technology of the last century? Um, and this is something that you cannot bring back. Um, and we have to continue to build this momentum. Simple solutions are possible. If you don't think with a healthcare IT regulation perspective the entire time, it is possible, it is necessary, yes, but if your product is not intuitive, no one's going to use it. And you need to have this culture of change, which COVID-19, I would argue, has brought to many. Because since COVID-19, we do not talk about digitization as, a, as an abstract uh, threat to who are always afraid that technology is, is, is kind of um, taking over the jobs, which wouldn't have happened because it's a very complex. Job. But now they are talking about their specific experience with product A, B, or C. And that challenges with the ICU register, which we finally have in Germany. But to be honest, it's still very much running on text machines because many of the hospitals do not have an infrastructure that would allow them to automatically report their ICU dates to a central location. So still people are taking notes and consolidating them in an Excel and they are sending them via fax to, to a central location. So we are still not where we want to be, but I would argue there's so much progress in the mindsets of the patients, patients and, and decision makers being done that we are now able to talk about a different plateau um, and, and really um, setting up the next steps. But as Nick and, and many other, others argued, you need to have a clear value proposition. You need to have use cases. Any physician need to understand why data is collected, what's been done with it. Even if it's not beneficial for the individual time being in the data, they would do so if they understand why it's done. And I'm very hopeful, and this may be my last remark, that a lot of this documentation efforts that are currently being done will be to some extent automated by voice technology because then people are just talking and to the patient and a voice AI is listening and, and in the end they just give all the important documentation efforts have been done. But the other thing which I think would really bring us a really a big step forward and that is one of one of the strongholds of the european observatory is actually to understand what other countries are doing when i heard nick initially presenting teleconsultation at the level in the uk i thought germany started and now literally in the year 2019 nick there were 3000 teleconsultations teleconsultations in the whole country, 3,000, and it went up to about 3 million last year. So 3 million is still not, is still not a lot in a country of, of, of 83 million, but it was an increased 1,000 fold. 
and 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 so and, and, and another example is this what, what Henrik just mentioned this intensive care register where many of the Germans thought they had invented something brand new and these intensive care registers actually are routine in Scandinavian countries in the Netherlands in the UK and 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 so on so often it's really worthwhile to understand and hopefully this summer school the observatory in general is trying to contribute and I think this is another weak point unfortunately in many health systems that that you know that they have this disease this disease not invented here that, that, that it makes it difficult to, to adopt. And you say, yeah, in Estonia, everybody knows everybody that they have digital health, but how can you import that to, how can you import that to Germany? Dimi, are there any other questions in the chat before we? Oh, there are many. I don't, <laughs> I don't think we will. I think maybe I, I just group them in two clusters and then you decide how you, how you take it forward. One is about data. You already started discussing this a little bit. Um, this difference, for example, in Italy between regional databases and the need to bring them together. COVID-19 pandemic is not a, 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 an issue of national borders. So there is also in the chat um, this notion about the European data protection regulations and how we ensure cross-country transferability of data. Um, but there are also other uh, um, um, concerns, let's say, in the chat or questions about data, for example, regarding data accuracy when there's data donation, um, and um, also where does the evaluation uh, come in of such new um, data platforms or, or data usages. This is one bit. So data, when it comes to privacy, when it comes to safety, when it comes to accuracy and quality. The other one is looking forward. So it is about for example, um, when Henrik mentioned that the, the Health Innovation Hub will be changed or reinvented uh, with, the new, with the new election, there was a question in the chat about what the new perspectives looking forward then should be and whether there should be hard targets for digital health. And I will um, uh, link to something that I'm sure Nick will be interested in talking about, which is where do we go from here? So we saw all this progress um, that colleagues have been talking about do we expect that this will remain after the pandemic or do we expect that once the external shock is gone we will go back to what we were used to before the pandemic started and i think those are maybe the two uh, the two main points from the chat there's still things coming up so if we have time at the end i can return we we take the data thing first even though we continue tomorrow but diff clearly with different speakers to talk also about about the data so that's a, that's an important uh, uh, issue. Anybody, Nick, you want to start again? And then Henrik? So I, I would love to because I, I uh, this whole, <laughs> right, I'm sure you have, I'm sure you have topics like this as well, where like every time it comes up, you get this kind of just horrible sinking feeling as soon as you, <laughs> and I, I think in a way, and I have so much sympathy for someone like Silvio and the, and, and, you're trying to link together, and it's the same for Germany as well, you know, a system which is very large, which has multiple actors, all the rest of these kinds of things. I'm going to be, I'm going to say something slightly controversial here. I think we have got our handling of data all wrong. Um, I think we have created a regime which makes it incredibly difficult for people to do the things that actually 90% of people, 90% of the time think are absolutely fine and doesn't stop the uses of data that people don't want to have happen. So we've made life really difficult for honest, well-intentioned actors, whilst not making it actually any, uh, whilst not preventing the things that we are concerned about, which strikes me as just an awful situation to be in. And the other thing I, I would say is, so one of, another part of my job here at Oxford, in because I'm part of a research group which works on this stuff, we did some work. We, we were setting up a local um, digital health portal around diabetes. And this was going to be a, a data pooling enterprise um, between uh, the hospital, researchers, primary care and patients. Right. So lots of different actors, lots of different pooling together of data. And we ran a patient engagement event to sort of right at the start to say, well, what do you think about this? And all the researchers came into this saying, oh God, this, this is going to be really very difficult and there's going to be so many questions and we need to have a lawyer there and we have all the rest of this kind of stuff. And everyone's terribly, terribly nervous. And the patients came in 
And they were absolutely unanimous. They were really frustrated. They were really cross. And what they were cross about was, why aren't you sharing our data? Why do I have to, when I go to the hospital, why do I have to provide, why am I carrying around? There was this, there was this woman who was there. She literally had like a set of USB sticks where she was carrying around her health data because she was like, I am sick of having to get, she's like, why aren't you all sharing your data? And I could see the researchers and the clinicians were saying, oh, that, that, that is not what we expected. So <laughs> I, I really have the sense that we have got this completely wrong. And Silvio, I don't know whether you would um, agree with this, but I have the sense that when you go to the population and you say, we want to be able to share data for public health, for the purposes of public policy and your immediate treatment and also the benefit of public health in the wider community within public authorities. The big divide comes when you shift from public to private. But amongst public authorities, I think if you go to the public and you say, we should just be able to share this data, are you okay with that? You would overwhelmingly get the answer yes. And I just, I, I'm really frustrated with the, the mechanism that we've corrupt, constructed. And I'm going to stop there because I will, otherwise I will go on for all the rest of our afternoon. <laughs> Okay, uh, Henrik, you also wanted to come in here. Yeah, just, just very briefly, I, I fully agree with Nick. And the problem, and this is bitter irony, is not GDPR, but it is the regime that every nation then has a massive uh, degree of freedom to how to operationalize that. And in Germany specifically, that on the government level, but also on the federal state level, they nominated data activists for the role of the ones who oversee how it's implemented and to decide in critical cases. And those have the urge to not have any data at all being stored, instead of understanding how can we make use of the data, especially now, and the level of technical competence is very limited. That. So the GDPR as a European um, harmonized uh, regime is absolutely right. And countries like Finland show that you can absolutely work uh, with it also on a national research scale, but the implementation on a national level, how we make it a, a, a absolutely mass of, of federal, local interpretations, every state in Germany decides you how to uh, work with inpatient data. So, how do we make um, and I would love to, uh, this discussion is always happening in, in, in public health uh, um, panels. I would love to have some time in the end to look into the future because somehow we need to get rid of this entire craziness. And I guess it's only possible if courageous institutions try to sue because the GDPR is really not the problem. It's the interpretation of the GDPR and it's making life of researchers horrible, but also of patients because they are being treated badly because no data is there of wrongly because the wrong data is there and so on. And, and this, would, I, I see only a legal uh, battle uh, uh, being possible to, to solve it um, because GDPR as such is not that. Silvio, before we then for some positive note turn to Cathy at the end. So why don't you <laughs> continue? Oh, thank here. you. Yeah, thank you very much. No, I completely agree with, the, with Nick and with uh, Eric. I, I think that, uh, the problem is standardization and the standardization in the both in countries and for bigger countries like Italy, also within countries, that is a, a even more complicated a regional level. But I can tell you before I was, I was nominated or was appointed as a president, I work in a regions like uh, the Northeastern part of Italy within regions, you know, local, local hospital uh, delegate for privacy were interpreting at their, uh, uh, their own. So it was very much complicated. And in the positive message, let's say, uh, I would say that probably uh, trying to set that the European level, this can be done also, I think this debate is showing that there's a possibility is there. Uh, show, you know, sharing at least a small amount of data for public health purposes. Uh, 
uh, look, starting from the pandemic that is perceived as emergency for, all, for almost all the population would be a possibility. Starting from that, probably we can say, you know, a set of data that we can share because they are public health utility, they are public health needs. And we need to share, not just in Italy, but within Europe, I think can be the positive measure or the positive measure from the school we can launch to the authorities and to lawyers, to authorities and to doctors, and, I, and also to population. When you feel, I completely agree with Nick. When you speak to people, say, look, we need this kind of data. We protect your data, but we need them to, pro to protect you and your community. People say yes, at least in the vast majority. Then the Novax is there also for data and will be there and again. But it's not the pro we can manage that, but the vast majority will be positive on that. Over. Thank you. Cathy? Thank you. Uh, I think in Estonia, what, what we have really put our effort into, of course, the data protection and GDPR topics and the debate is very much alive in Estonia. And then there is, of course, a school of people who, who want to close up all the data and not give a permission to anybody to see anything. And then and then there's a other group of people who want um, the data to be way more accessible than maybe it's even on the line of it, is it reasonable to make the make it so easy to to get all the data however what we see in estonia is that considering the health data or the medical data or medical records data then we put a lot of emphasis into um, uh, how to make it as transparent the data use as transparent as possible so we have this opt-out system for for the data so so um at first, all people's data is being collected in this national health information system, right? But if anyone is using the data, it's always, people can always access the logs of data use. So they know exactly who has watched their data, when and for what reason. And uh, this, uh, this goes for the, all the public officials, uh, for the automated data use or, the, or for the doctors being looking up the data. So, so we make this transparency makes it possible for, for the system to regulate itself much more than, than just locking away all the data. Of course, for the secondary use, there's still more, um, more systems in place to not make it so easy. Um, but I think uh, on the side of this, uh, the usability of data is not if you can get your hands to the data or not. The question is standardization of the data itself. In Estonia, the big, bigger question rather than GDPR is that how to make the data that we have collected understandable across the healthcare professionals across uh, and then also like across the borders of Estonia, because a lot of our data right now is uh, just uh, free text data, which is almost impossible to to analyze afterwards. It takes so much work. So what we're really looking into now is to how to standardize the language that we use, how to standardize the, the data collection and the data use so that um, so that we speak the same language in the data and how can we create this uh, metadata or or the all the cre data creation in in so that we can translate into into different um, contexts and also for the cross-border data exchange. So this is I think is uh, is a topic that should have totally its own day in the summer school to to talk about how to how to get to to this point thank you yes thank you and i think for all of us it's reassuring that even in estonia there are still unsolved issues and that it's not everything put in put in stone and that you have all discovered it already but it's all the better that we clearly look at what you have done and, and that other countries are trying to uh, use these experience and vice versa for their own uh, health policy solutions. That brings us to an end of the today, which is only the first session. Maybe I should say we are directly following from this tomorrow because tomorrow's topic is then the next uh, the next step from data to information. So the idea tomorrow is that we look at what kind of information we can derive from having these data. And when they are digitalized, that we get more data and from different uh, sources and so on. So that will be the topic of today. For today, thank you colleagues from Estonia, Katy, 
from Germany, Henrik, from Italy, uh, Sil Silvio, and of course, Nick to you for, our, for your introductory lecture. We will see you also for the next uh, days and then see you hopefully tomorrow and over the next days. Bye-bye.